Good morning and welcome to the North England Conference Pathway of Hope Morning Devotion and Prayer Time. We want to thank you all for joining us this morning. David, the man after God's own heart, in Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but will remember the name of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we should remember to anchor ourselves on God. Our prayer team meets twice a day, and if you want us to pray for you, please send us your prayer requests on the Pathway of Hope website, and we will pray for you. Our special speaker for this morning is Pastor Dan. I trust and pray that you'll be blessed as you listen to the man of God this morning during our devotion. God bless. The psalm it says, let us praise the Lord for his wonderful hearts to the children of men. Let us pray. Mighty God, we are thankful for the privilege to come before your presence this morning and to worship you. For your mercies are new to us today. Thank you for the angels that watch over us. Thank you for preserving our lives. Thank you that we can communicate one with the other as we come together to fellowship and to worship you, to give you the highest praise because you deserve such. Thank you that you did not leave us in our sins, but you have called us to come unto you just as we are. And as we come, you, you have cleansed us from our sins and our unrighteousness. And you have given us overcoming power over sin. And so we praise your name for your wonderful hacks to the children of men. We praise you for the power of forgiveness. That you have blotted out our sins and our transgressions. And you have taught us to forgive one another. We are thankful for the plan of salvation so that we can come unto you as we are, but then you make us into what we ought to be so that our lives can glorify you. We can be conduits through whom you can work to reach the hearts of your people around us. We praise your name for your loving kindness towards us, that you hear us when we call and you help us when we fall. Thank you for those whom you, who have availed themselves to you so that you can use them to spread the message of salvation. We worship you because with you there is no one that is hopeless. We praise you for embodying us in your love in spite of our situations and our failures. No matter how far we have gone, you reach us down and you lift us up. We adore you, God, for such love, such might, and such power that you manifest in our lives. May you accept our praise and our worship as we magnify your name today, as we lift you up. May you accept all praise because you deserve to be praised, to be honored and glorified. So hear our prayers, Lord. Accept our praise. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that empower us to live the life that counts. Because of ourselves, we cannot do it, but with you, all things are possible. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us, but that you journey with us moment by moment in our difficult times, in our joyful times, you are with us. Thank you for the many answered prayers, the miracles that you have wrought for us. We magnify your name. We adore you. Accept our praise, Lord, and let your will be done in our lives. For we pray to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
In case you have fallen by the wayside of life, dreams and visions shattered, you are broken inside. You don't have to stay in the shade that you're in. The potter wants to put you back together. Good morning, children. Welcome to our worship time. Let us pray. Let's bow our heads. Dear kind and loving Father, thank you for another beautiful, wonderful day with the beautiful sunshine and everything pleasant. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come to worship you. Please bless, our, bless us in our worship and help us to do your will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, do you know the song, I have a joy, 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 joy down in my heart? You might want to sing it today. It's a very good song for making us smile and it brings joy to our hearts. So the word for today is joy. Now what sort of things bring joy to you? Having your family and friends around you, going on a special trip, having a lovely meal, having a birthday gift, love from your mom and dad, love from your grandparents or your other relatives such as your aunts and uncles, love from your friends. Yes, all of these things bring us great joy. God also wants us to find joy in him. Because joy is something that he can give us and it will last forever because joy from the Lord is everlasting. 
God wants us to have joy so much that he made joy one of the fruit of the Spirit. And that can be found in Galatians 5 verses 22 to 23. And it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So today, be joyful because God our Saviour and Creator wants us to be joyful. He wants us to have joy so that we can help others around us to find joy in him. Because when we find joy in the Lord, we are worshipping him and we are making him joyful because we can bless the Lord with our joy. So today, the word is joy. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. to give you some words of encouragement. COVID-19 has brought fear and anxiety to all of us. People have lost their jobs and loved ones. Some people have no money and no food. But the good news is that God is still God of mercy. I'm therefore going to read the words of encouragement taken from Psalms 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not lay foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade 
at your night at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying with us through this program. I pray that you have been blessed, that you have enjoyed all that has taken place and that you can bring joy to someone by telling them what a wonderful worship time you had. Let us bow and thank the Lord for the joy as we pray and bless him. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your joy. Thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you for this time of worship that we have had and we pray that as we go into the day we will bring joy to others because this is your will. Be with us we pray. Thank you for everything in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Have a joyful day. Bye bye. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've done for us. Um, can, can you protect the people that are in need and the people that, um, that the children that are in war, can you protect them? Can, can they be in your hands, dear Lord? And can, can you help the sick people that are in the hospital and so on and not? Thank you for protecting us from this virus and thank you for what you've done for us, dear Lord. Can you protect us all the way through our lives and can can someday people know who truly who who the true God is. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, our everlasting Father, we come before you again this morning. To recognize that you are God. We thank you, O Lord, for the messages that you have given to the pastors, to leaders and organizers of this campaign, the pathway of hope. We thank you for reminding us that we have hope in you and that we can depend upon you. We can trust you. We can worship you and you love us. Dear God, specifically, I would like to bring the children who have returned back to school during this COVID pandemic. Dear Father, O oh Lord, you know their anxieties, their fears, their concerns. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will comfort their hearts, that they will know, O oh Lord, that you are with them. We pray, O oh Father, that they will come to have their faith and their trust in you, and not be fearful, for they are so special in your eyes. They are so special to you, O oh Lord. Dear Father, we pray, O oh Lord, for the teachers, the head headmistresses and headmasters of the various schools, from the nursery all the way to the university, that you will give them wisdom in all their planning and their arrangements to create an environment in which the young people can learn and in which the teachers and administrators can carry out their work safely. Give them wisdom, O oh Lord. Give the government understanding and a better understanding of the condition under which these teachers and administrators have to work and the young people have to learn. And that, O oh Father, you will continue to give them wisdom on how to plan it each week until this COVID situation is under control. We pray, O oh Father, that the young people will be cooperative, that they will realize that it's for their own safety. And those who are suffering from anxiety, those who are concerned about their health, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will strengthen their bodies, you will strengthen their health, their immunities, that they will be able to function in this environment, because you are here with them. You will guide them, you will protect them, you will bless them. 
help them to apply themselves to their studies, and may they faithfully apply themselves. Those who cannot make it back at school, we pray, O oh Father, that you, they will have an environment and that their sponsors and the parents will create that environment for them to study online. Dear Father, guide, O oh Lord, this nation. Guide your world, O oh Lord, for you love this world, you created it. Until you come to take us back home, grant us wisdom to live, to function, to do the things that we have to do in this world, but to remember at all times that you are with us, that you have prayed for us, O Lord Jesus, that you ask not to take us out of this world, but to keep us from the evil one. So we are asking, O Lord, I'm asking that you keep the young people from the evil one, that they will desire to know you and to love you and to know that they don't need to be fearful. Put their trust in you, O Lord. May they learn to know that you care, you love them, and they are the apple of your eyes. We thank you for everything you have done for us and we recommit ourselves again to you this day. And as we go forward with the rest of the program, we pray for your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and to change us into the image of Christ Jesus. Bless us, O oh Lord, with the right character that the fruit of the Holy Spirit will be formed and developed in us so we can live to give you the honor and glory and worship and admiration that you and you alone deserve. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this day and as we look forward to the programs, may your spirit continue to guide. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. Good morning. This morning we're going to be petitioning the Lord on behalf of those who are feeling the pressure of lockdown. Some are feeling lonely. Some are feeling that the strain is getting to them that they're starting to have a mental breakdown. But we know who has the cure for all this. So we're going to pray on behalf of those who are feeling this way. Our Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, again we thank you for your mercies. Father, you know the situation at the moment around the world and what's happening. You know, for some people, depression has set in. Some are lonely. Some are feeling separated from their families, especially our older members within the family of God and also around the world. We know, dear Father, that you have sent the Comforter to all of us. And especially now, we require the Comforter, Lord, to comfort those who are feeling lonely, those who are feeling separated, especially for some of our elderly who for the first time may have had a grandchild and are unable to cuddle that grandchild because of their vulnerability to this virus at the moment. For those who feel shut in, who haven't left the home for a while and depression may be setting in. Even, Lord, the mental issue within our human structure. Indeed, dear Lord, we know that you are in control and it doesn't matter what the environment may be, you can give us that peace that will really keep our minds free and available to all things, especially to your Holy Spirit. Lord, take charge, I pray. Let those who are feeling the lockdown and it causing them anxiety to know that you are there with them. Let those who are feeling the separation from family know that you are there with them. Hear my humble prayer this morning and Lord continue to do the work that you have been doing throughout this world in allowing those who are feeling this lockdown to know that there's somebody that cares about them and somebody that loves them. Bless them, I pray, to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.
Trust in God, hope in Him, depend on Him. These are the adjoining themes under the slogan, We Have an Anchor, for our morning devotional and prayer. We have an anchor means we have this hope, we have this trust. We anchor and fasten onto something that is forever steadfast, immovable, and strong. And so our song says that the anchor is fastened to the rock that cannot move, grounded, firm, and deep in the Savior's love. This is our worldview, the worldview of Christians. And this is how we express within our own bubble as believers. But today, I want to bring your minds a little bit outside of our Bible, I want to present to you in brief the songs of others in their own boats to briefly expose you to the worldview of others, their philosophy, their belief system. They can be our family member, our neighbor, our friend, the person on the street, and for sure the society in general. If we are only acquainted with our own songs within our own lifeboats, within ourselves, we won't be able to understand what others are singing in their own lifeboats, and we will not have a better understanding where their anchors are fastened upon. To know what others think is important because a person's life is dictated by how he or she thinks. The Bible knows how powerful a worldview is, and so it warns us Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And so it is my goal that you will see a clearer glimpse of where you stand, the difference between what you stand for in relation to what others have stood for, to see a preview of comparison between the Christian worldview and that of others, but above all, to affirm and to confirm that you and I as Christians are offering something different, something unique, and something that we should not be reluctant or ashamed to share where our belief system, our philosophy, our outlook in life is anchored and grounded upon. And so I have to begin by saying the reason why we are different from others or why others are different from us is because each one has his or her own worldview. Now a worldview is the set of beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all one's perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. A worldview is one's philosophy of life, a person's mindset, a person's outlook on life someone's formula for life, and someone's faith. So it isn't just a theory that stays in the head. Worldview actually dictates the general running of the person's life until he or she dies. And so it's so real and it's so powerful. Many people are aware of it, but many are not. However, aware or not, worldview is present in every thinking man or woman, present in every single person's thought. Now, there are many different worldviews. There are different branches of them. 
But all of these worldviews can come from three main ones, and I want to share these with you. The first one is the mind worldview. What is it? Well, you have heard about the Greek thinker and philosopher Plato. Plato was the student of Socrates. Socrates was a great, brilliant thinker. He did not write his philosophies, but his student Plato continued to think like him and put these ideas and philosophies into writing. They had immense influence on how the next thousand years people think and behave after these two great teachers have long died. Even today, that is why I'm bringing this, because the influence of their philosophies affects people not just in the Western world, but people from all walks of life all around the world. This powerful teaching is saying that we can access truth in the mind. You don't know much because you do not think much. Close your eyes, contemplate, let the mind transcend beyond your present reality. The goal is for the mind to get its wisdom and ultimate knowledge from up there. When he says from up there, please do not think that he is referring to the God that we know. Up there, according to Plato, is a realm of knowledge, pure and true, tapped by the mind, will provide the ultimate truth. The famous line is this, I think therefore I am. Transcendental meditation, as practiced by Eastern religion, is just one of its many forms to have emerged later as influenced by this mind worldview. What is interesting, and the most influential of all, is that man is composed of two parts, the corrupt body and the immortal soul. Please listen carefully, because this is where the rest of the Christians and the rest of the world is heavily influenced. This soul is the mind that carries reasoning and wisdom. It is immortal because, you see, you cannot kill idea and you cannot kill wisdom. And this immortal soul is trapped in this wretched body. But at the time of death, according to Plato, this soul is freed and will now go back up there where it originally belongs. This seems like what you have always believed before, and perhaps some of you until now. If that is true in your case, then Plato has influenced you in one of his major teachings. Plato wrote the account on how his master Socrates died. Socrates was persecuted by the authorities because of his particular idea that threatens them. He was sentenced to die by drinking a powerful poison from a hemlock plant. Now, when Socrates drank the poison, there was no trace of his sentency. His students around him were crying like little children, and he, Socrates, was the one who passed and stop them because life, he said, will not cease but will simply continue its journey beyond the grave. Some other teachings of Plato are not accepted today, of course, but many Christian theologians, especially Augustine, the Latin philosopher and theologian in Roman Catholicism, is formally recognized as a doctor of the church. Picked some of Plato's powerful ideas, Augustine championed the idea of the immortality of the soul and injected it into the Christian theology. To him, mind is life. Without mind, everything is dead. Mind is the real life. If it is life, it cannot lack life. It cannot be killed. It is therefore immortal, according to him. Not even hell can kill it. Hell can only torture it. And so the doctrine of immortal soul lives on. And the implication is that many people will be suffering forever and ever in hell. They would not die, just tortured forever. This is according to the largest Christian denomination in the world, according to the majority of the Protestant evangelical world, according to Hollywood, according to every young person who does not know who read the Word of God. Immortal soul came from Augustine, who got it from Plato, who got it from Socrates, who lived 399 BC. And so the solid truth regarding the second coming of Jesus into this planet, which he promised, is being undermined. You see, the purpose as to why Jesus is going to return is to take his followers. Those who died in him will be resurrected into immortality. Those who are alive at his coming will be changed from mortal into immortality. These will all happen on this planet at his return. The saints will be brought to heaven in the future at his second coming. But suddenly, with the teaching of the immortality of the soul, there is no need now to look forward to the great resurrection because the dead loved ones are enjoying there in heaven right now. You have to understand that this particular teaching is based on the philosophies of men alien to what the Bible teaches. The truth is, only God is immortal. The soul who sins shall die. No one is immortal. Here we can see the evidence from Scripture, and you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be afraid, 
those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So people think that soul is indestructible, that no one can destroy it. But there is one, and that one is referring to God. He can destroy both the body and the spirit. He can bring both into dust and will cease to exist forever. Only God is immortal. But this mind worldview, this Socrates Platonic philosophy, creeps into the belief system of the vast majority of Christians and even non-Christians. For the Eastern religions, the soul is immortal in that it continues on in what they call transmigration the cyclic existence to live into a different form of life. Thanks to the influence of the mind worldview, you may not hear of it, but the people around you believe, they hope, and they trust, and they act on it. That is where their faith is anchored upon. They live with it and die with it. Now, the next one is another powerful worldview that has an immense influence to the world we live in now. It is called the nature worldview. Nature worldview, this is now Aristotle, the student of Plato. An extremely brilliant thinker who questions and refutes his teacher. If you remember, Aristotle, the student of Plato, is the teacher of Alexander the Great, the conqueror of the world. Aristotle, in response to the teaching of Plato, said, No. In order to understand reality and to know the truth of the universe, the direction is not up there. It is down here. You see, Plato taught that it is up there. However, Aristotle insists that yes, the mind is the processor, the mind must think, but it is not the source, not the source of truth out there. Aristotle argues, look, no one has an inherent idea before they were born. You need to do the observation. If mind and the realm of knowledge up there is the source of truth, then why do people think differently? People should have altogether have the same or uniform ideas of everything. And so he says the reason people think differently is because people have a unique association, unique observation, experiences in their own unique places. And in this portrait, you can see that Plato points his finger up whilst Aristotle is pointing his finger down. He insisted that you've got to study and observe down here. So this is now the complete revolution of thinking. Now this powerful teaching is saying that we can access truth around us. You don't know much because you do not study and observe enough. We can access truth by gathering data. And so we have to use correct method of understanding things. We need evidence, logic, and reasoning in order to arrive at the correct conclusion. Things that we can see and smell, touch, and hear are the sources of knowledge. The nature is the source of knowledge and truth. We have to discover them. We have to explore and experiment things around and within our reach and as far as we can reach. And therefore, out of this Aristotelian philosophy comes science. And science is defined as a systematic and orderly arrangement of knowledge based on facts, observation, and correct thinking. This is Aristotle. Of course, the earliest roots of science can be traced to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia in around 3500 to 3000 BC. But Aristotle is the one towering figure who influenced ancient Greek philosophy and the world making contributions to logic, metaphysics, mathematics, physics, biology, botany, ethics, politics, agriculture, medicine, dance, and even theater. Look at the things around you. Technological advancement, modernity, prosperity, and vast knowledge in various things. These are the direct results that can be credited to Aristotelian philosophy. In fact, Aristotle is the father of Western culture. That is why the Western culture is a never-ending pursuit of knowledge which results in new and continuing inventions and modernizations. From 2007 to 2013, Europe and the UK spent 107 billion euros on research development and innovation. In the US, in 2018 alone, the spending total on academic scientific research is 176.8 billion US dollars. NASA's space exploration is 22.6 billion dollars. And since its inception, the US has spent nearly 650 billion dollars on NASA. Now, why spend billions on research? Why space exploration? Why go to the moon, Mars, and why send unmanned aircraft into space? Well, because the Western culture wants to get the answers of life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we headed? How do we solve our problems? The goal is to find how to manipulate atoms to create substances and medicines that will make man live in comfort and solve our difficulties and problems. Science wants to create a potion called the fountain of youth. This nature worldview that expresses itself in science, promoting evolutionary theory and rejecting God, wants to solve death through scientific research so that man may live forever. 
Some people are frozen at their death. They want to be revived as soon as the cure for their disease or the aging process has been found. It isn't just a theory or the philosophy of Aristotle. It is now the way of life, the way of governance. Worldview is powerful. Philosophy is not just in the mind. It is translated into our way of life. Our thinking governs how we conduct ourselves and how we perceive realities around us. But then comes the third worldview. This is called the revealed or the revelation worldview. What is revelation? Well, revelation from the word reveal. Like when we say, please reveal to me the secret. To reveal is to show, to unravel, to open and to tell. This is the revealed or revelation worldview. Do you want to know the truth of your beginnings? Here I will reveal to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This worldview is saying you will not know the biggest questions in life unless I will open it up, unless I will unravel it for you, unless I will tell you. Before space and matter existed, there was God. Do you want to know where you are now? You are in the last days of earth's history. Christ Jesus came already for the first time. He promised to come again, and soon He will come again as He has promised. Do you want to know where this planet is headed? Yes, you are headed steadily for the worse. As you can see, disasters are happening everywhere. Calamities upon calamities all around us. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, including SARS, AIDS, Ebola, COVID-19. All the difficulties happening around the world, man-made and natural disasters, are signs of the nearness of Christ's return. This planet, wrecked with violence, sufferings, and death, will soon end. But don't worry, because God will recreate it into a new and perfect world. Revelation worldview says of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This worldview is written in this book. Here contains the revealed Word of God. This worldview is different from the previous two. You don't need a telescope. You don't need a microscope or a horoscope to know the future because it is God who reveals the past, the present, and the future. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. The revealed worldview is saying that Plato is wrong because Mind is limited in its capacity. And most importantly, mind is not independent of the body. Mind dies when body dies. The mind, or that so-called soul, is not immortal. God alone is immortal. Even Lucifer is not immortal. When the time comes for God to end sin, Lucifer and all his demons will be cast into the lake of fire, including all people who willfully refuse the loving offer of salvation, consumed by the fire, consumed and turned into ashes. No root or branch will be left. They will all die. Their death is permanent. This is the plan of God revealed in this book. It is not through observation or space exploration that we understand the real story of the world and the universe. Truth comes because it is freely given and is revealed. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when we read God's Word, we know we cannot find any solution to the problem of death except in Jesus. You see, truth is a person, and this person is Jesus Christ. You search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus never said, I have found the way. He says, I am the way. He did not say, I know the truth. He says, I am the truth. He did not tell us that he found life. He says plainly and without any ambiguity, I am the life. Truth is not in the mind. Truth cannot be obtained through observation and experimentation. Truth is a person in the person of Jesus Christ. To him, our trust, our hope, our faith is anchored upon. The rest of the philosophies, these worldviews are soon to collapse and crumble. So now, mind, nature, or revelation. Can you see the difference? Where are you banking on? Where are you standing on? Where is your anchor fastened upon? Is it in the philosophies of men or is it in the person of Jesus? We have this hope, this faith. We have this trust. We anchor and fasten unto Jesus who is forever steadfast, immovable, and strong. I personally put my trust 
onto the Son of God and His claim rather than on the sophisticated philosophies of man. As we have already learned, when we talk about anchors, we think of a device normally made of metal used to connect to a vessel to the bed of a body of water to prevent the craft from drifting because of the wind and the strong current. And so our minds and our imaginations think of a sea vessel like this. In fact, we can see this gigantic anchor here being tested as the metal is dropped into the water. You see, every proper vessel, every single one of them, is provided an anchor before it could sail or travel into the deep. No sea vessel is complete without the anchor. No Christian is complete without hope, without trust, and without faith. And this brings me to my last point. You won't be able to use your anchor if you remain only on dry land. The actual dropping and the retrieval of the anchor happens on the water. Your ship, your boat, your vessel's anchor cannot be used if you and your vessel remain on the shore. If your vessel is going to make it somewhere, you have to take it to the water. You have to experience the wind, be familiar with the current, feel the waves. You've got to step out of the dry land, step out of comfort, step into the cold water, embark on a mission for Jesus. Let them know that you have an anchor. Declare to them whom your anchor is fastened upon. The philosophies of men are crumbling. These philosophies are built on a sinking sand. Offer to them the love of God. Point them to the source of life. Lovingly articulate that there is a better offer revealed in the person of Jesus. Step into the water. Climb into that vessel. You will never learn how to use your anchor. You'll never know your purpose. You'll never know how solid the Savior is if you just remain standing on the shore. Lord, thank you that we can count on you. Our stability, our safety, and our security are in your hands. Give us your wisdom and love as we articulate the good news to others. We pray that you help them see the better way in and through Jesus. Amen.
we thank God for speaking to us this morning through his manservant, Pastor Dan. Indeed, it has been a blessing to listen to this powerful message. And we should always remember that Christ and Christ alone is the solid rock and all other ground is sinking sand. And our speaker for tomorrow is Pastor Patrick Herbert. At this moment, we'll close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you in a very special way for this message. The message that has set us to go through the day. Father, when we are tempted to remember, to think that you are on our own, may we be reminded that you are the solid rock. You are the anchor that will hold us fast every time. May you be with each and every one of us this morning. Thank you for using your man servant. Bless Pastor Dan in a very special way. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you all for joining us, and may you have a blessed day. God bless. We have an anchor that